Hello, BookTube. I've got a little mail for you today on a downright grim Tuesday, weather-wise. <laughs> the, the air is not cold, but there's an enormous rainstorm that is sweeping out to the eastern coast of the United States of America, virtually the whole of it. it covers like nine or ten states. It's not a big thing. It's not a dangerous thing, but uh, we're on the very fringe of it. We've been on the very fringe of it for the last few hours. So walking outside, it is not raining. But <laughs> it's not exactly dry either. Uh, the rain, I think, is, is going to intensify tonight. I think it'll be pouring rain by midnight. Uh, but that still allowed the mail to get through. We have two periodicals and two packages and one very depressed bee. Aren't you making a very depressed bee? Yes, you <laughs> she knows that her, her mortal enemy is coming. She knows that. <laughs> uh, but we have two periodicals. One is a square-bound glossy magazine, Vanity Fair. Uh, which had a couple of really interesting things in it. I mean, this is, it's a lot of fluff, and it's a lot of, uh, frankly, uh, incomprehensible modern fashion. <laughs> uh, let me show you the, uh, the egregious example this time around. Uh, yeah, this guy stole my outfit. <laughs> Uh, but uh, Vanity Fair has always been that way, and it, it, you, you can rely on it. It's a tiny thing compared to the size that it was when Graydon Carter was in charge of it. But you can rely on every issue of Vanity Fair to have something in it that will interest you. Some big, detailed piece of nonfiction reporting or culture writing that took its author a long time to research and write. Usually took their author a long time to research and write. And Vanity Fair pays fairly well for that kind of work. So you, it's a place where you can get that. You have to go to the back half of it. You'll never find it up front. Uh, and this issue had two of those. Uh, I want to show you one that relates directly to the book world and it has my favorite title of, of any of them. This is a piece by Joy Press and it's about the, uh, the CEO of Scholastic uh, who died suddenly last year and left control of the family empire uh, to his ex-girlfriend. Uh, you can just imagine all of the Upper West Side it, furor that resulted of that. And the, uh, the name of the piece is Big Red Flag. <laughs> big Red Flag, because, of course, Scholastic owns big, uh, Clifford the Big Red Dog. And uh, the piece, I guess, I haven't read it yet, is I guess the piece is going to muckrake about, you know, what's going on, who gets what, who's in a position to get what, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but the other really good piece in this issue, this one I did read, of course, because all things Windsor, all things the House of Windsor. This is by Mark Seal, and it's called The Prince and the Predator. And it's about uh, Britain's Prince Andrew and Jeffrey Epstein. Uh, and it really gives you a sort of a, a you know, a one-stop shopping overview of what we know about that story. I don't think we're going to learn much more about that story. The The official sources have either comforted themselves by buying off hostile witnesses or, in my opinion, been murdered. I, in my opinion, it's pretty clear that Jeffrey Epstein was murdered. <laughs> and that could easily happen to his confederate. Jillian Maxwell is in prison. She could easily end up dead as well. She's shown no indication to tell tales out of school. And the stories that Prince Andrew knows, I don't think, can ever be prized out of him. So we might not know any more than what we learn in this article. The article is still fascinating. Uh, and the other, the other uh, periodical was the TLS, the Times Literary Supplement, uh, the greatest literary review journal in the English language, uh, that had a lot of interesting things in it this time around, although one thing in it I found more interesting than anything else, and that is this. Let me show you the, uh, the picture. This is a review by Maria Marga Marganaris. No, I can do better than that. Margaronis. Maria Margaronis wrote a review of The 47, a new play at the Old Vic in London by Mike Bartlett about Trump and Biden and Kamala Harris and whatnot. Got a picture and a nice full page review that spills over a little onto the other page. The play sounds fantastic. Uh, uh, it sounds infuriating, but also very interesting. And the reason why it's of particular interest to me uh, is because of Open Letters Review the online literary journal, the free online literary journal, where I am one of the editors, along with a few other names on our masthead that you might know if you watch Booktube. And recently I found uh, a theater critic, or he found me, or maybe a little of both. And he, his name is Christopher Day, and he has been reviewing the stage in London and outward in, in all boroughs west uh, for Open Letters Review. 
it's a tremendous thrill. He's very good and stands only to get better as time goes on. It's a tremendous thrill to, to be able to publish his work when no one else knows about him. The TLS doesn't know about him. None of the London uh, newspaper or, or, or square-bound journals that still run theater reviews know about him. They will, but they don't yet. So it's a thrill to be able to do that. And he reviewed the 47 for me. He went and saw it. And we ran a review on Open Letters. If I remember, I'll leave a link to his review. I keep meaning to uh, uh, cry his work from the rooftops. Ordinarily, Open Letters is Open Letters review is a, a slightly different thing. It's a slightly different working concept. Uh, it's very, very hands off. It's very, very low key. So ordinarily, if somebody runs their work on Open Letters, I expect them to trumpet it from the rooftops. I expect them to use their own social media if they want anybody to know about it. <laughs> and I will do the same for my own work and everybody else. And that'll, that'll be sort of a, a wiki approach to uh, promoting the work. Uh, I'm not really all that interested in promoting the site. I want to promote the individual work. Uh, but in this case, I mean to trumpet it from the rooftops. I will do that. I will, I will let this, be, serve, this article serve as a reminder to me to get the word out. Uh, because I, I would... As thrilling as it is, it's always thrilling. I don't know how many of you have ever been in this position, but if you're if you're a working editor, it's always thrilling to find a genuine talent. That's always thrilling, uh, because for a little while anyway, genuine talent outs. At least in the in the the old Bailey hack freelance world, genuine talent tends to out, especially if it's matched with work ethic. If you're consistent, then it will out. Which means that the thrill that you have from finding the genuine article is it's sweet, but it's all the sweeter because it's temporary. You're not going to have this person all to yourself forever, and there's a, there's a melancholy kind of joy in that. So so, but the forty seventh, if you want a nice review of it, there's one on Open Letters Review, where ordinarily, you know, I don't I I take stringers, correspondents, experts wherever I can find them, wherever I can find them. If you live in New York City and you are young, and you would like to break into the freelance writing world, and you are interested, for instance, in art, let's say you already save your pennies and go to every art exhibit that shows up in New York and you think you could write about them, get in touch with me. Feel free to let me know. I do not have an art correspondent in New York or London or Paris or wherever. We're just someplace that has major exhibits, even Boston. If there are tens of thousands of students in Boston. If you would like to do that, it, I am offering you a launch pad, and it's not a bad one, <laughs> right? When you look at the masthead of open letters, you see plenty of people who get regular freelance work, and editors notice that. You see uh, plenty of people who do nothing but review, and editors notice that. There aren't many people like that left in the world. Two of them are on the masthead of open letters. So, so if you want to do that, it's not open letters book review. It's open letters review. If you want, if like for instance, art, if art installations, art shows, there's a new uh, Jam Turner exhibit, for instance, uh, here in Boston. I'm not going to go to see it. I'd love someone to write it up. That would be great. <laughs> but anyway, anyway, we also have two packages. Uh, uh, no boxes. Just, just two things that I, I don't. I don't want to overwhelm the speakers. <laughs> the, the sound, I'm told, can sometimes be problematic, as the kids say. Oh, fantastic. Oh, great. All right. Uh, this next one's good. This is going to be late April. Yes, this is this is late April. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to get to it, but I will try. Uh, this comes out on the 26th. The release date is the 26th. Is that today? That could very well be today. This is Janet McGregor's new Regency romance, Rules for Engaging the Earl. <laughs> In one of these square... Paperback. So the, the the old style, the old paperback that was thinner, is gone. It, it, in the if romance has gone this way, they'll all go this way. And so this is this is square. I've often said, actually, let's test this out. I've often said that the thing that's driving this is an attempt to mimic the square shape of a Kindle. As you can see, uh, that is a perfect match. <laughs> they are exactly the same dimension. Whereas, do I have? Uh, might as well do the testing right here, right? While we're all yes, I do. Okay, hang on, <laughs> hang on. Sorry for the uh, the jowls. Uh, the normal size paperback is this. 
This is uh, an old signet of the Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad. Uh, the Secret Chair and other stories. Of course, the most popular story in here cannot be printed on the cover of a book uh, because of its title. Uh, this was the shape of those old ones. So let's line that up on the spine there. See, you've got an extra extra half an inch there uh, that sticks out. So, so this uh, is not the same size as a Kindle. If you line them up, it's taller and thinner. Whereas this is exactly the same size as a Kindle. <laughs> they are exactly the same size. They match completely. Uh, so I was at least right that, that the dimensions bear that out. I don't know if that was the reason, but uh, I don't like it either way. <laughs> because with a Kindle, you're holding it with one hand, right? You're turning the pages with one hand. It's all one-handed literature. <laughs> Whereas this, no, you have to hold it open. It's extremely awkward to do. It doesn't feel right in the hand at all. But what have we got here? Uh, actually, I got to sleep. I don't want to block the bean. Uh, she's very, very depressed. She knows that rain is coming, <laughs> I think. Uh, let's see here. Get ready for lost wills, bloody broody dukes, and scorching hot kisses all over London. <laughs> Constant Lysander needs a husband. Or so society says. She's about to give birth to her late husband's child, a man who left her with zero money and two other wives she didn't know about. Thankfully, she has her aunt by her side, and the, two other, and the two other wives have become close friends. But still, with a baby on the way, her shipping business to run, and an enemy skulking about, she has no time to find the perfect match. Enter Jonathan, Earl of Sky, Sykes, Sykeston. S-Y-K-E-S, Sykeston. Uh, returned war hero and Constance's childhood best friend, his re-entry into society has been harsh. Maligned for an injury he received in the line of duty, Jonathan prefers... To stay out of sight, is the injury disfiguring? That would be interesting. It's almost never, almost never done. Why would he be maligned for an injury? I want to know. I'm already intrigued. It's the only way to keep his heart from completely crumbling. But when a missive from Constance requests his presence to their marriage ceremony, <laughs> Jonathan is on board. His feelings for Constance run deep, and he'll do anything to make her happy, though it means risking his already bruised heart. With John, Constance, Jonathan, and the new baby all together, it's clear the wounds, both on the surface and in their relationships, run deep. But when the nights come, their wounds begin to heal, and both come to realize that their marriage of convenience is so much more than just a bargain. <laughs> okay, well, I, I'm, uh, I'm on board, and this is, this is out now, I think, probably in your bookstores. If this, I don't have a calendar in front of me, but if this is the 26th, Actually, I do have a character in front of me. Good Lord. <laughs> yes, this is, in fact, Tuesday the 26th. So this book has a release date of today. So uh, if your retail bookstore, your Barnes & Noble, for a little while, that will still be Boston. You'll have a Barnes & Noble to go to. If you want this book, and for some weird reason you don't want to download it directly to your Kindle in an instant without moving, without putting on boots, without going out in the rain. If you want to buy this weird square paperback of this book, uh, you and you go to your bookstore and they say, well, it, it isn't there. It isn't in the new release section anymore. It isn't there yet. It came out today. It could very well be on a cart in the back room. So in this particular instance, it might be worth your while to summon your inner Karen and say, could you please check to see if it's physically here in the store? Your inventory computer is telling you that you have two on hand. Uh, that would happen when the box is open and the book is scanned by the receiver in the, re in the mail room. That isn't a reflection of whether or not it's on the shelf. But it does mean the book is physically in the store, and to save you the trouble of going back, you might want to just say, could you maybe check the romance cart in the back and see if it's actually here, because I'd like to buy a copy. Uh, I would hope that your retail book sale clerk would immediately smile and say, yes, I'll do that right now. I would hope that would be the case. I know there's no grounds for that hope, because even in the good old days when I was at the Barnes & Noble at the Prudential Center that is closing, in June, that store is going away. A vast ocean of books. They're going. That store is just going away. Who knows what stupid thing will take its place? But even in those years, the last years of my working in retail book selling, I would often be at my information desk. I'd be talking to a customer. I'd be helping them, and I would hear a colleague of mine next to me tell a customer who asked that exact question. I'm afraid I can't. <laughs> I'd have to say, uh, hold on, dear, for just a minute. Uh, my colleague just lied to you. They certainly can go and check for that. They're obviously not going to do it. If you'll wait just a second, I'll go and get it myself. I don't know why they lied to you. And it, I, that happened more than a few times where the, the, the clerk was just being an a-hole. That's all. I would hope that doesn't happen to you. <laughs> but anyway, this comes out today. 
This is released today, and it sounds absolutely delightful. She simply emails her old childhood friend and says, Look, I need a husband. You're it. <laughs> that sounds like so much fun. So I will read this today no matter what. Even though it's not an ebook. I will still read it today. Uh, then we've got another... One more package here, and then we'll be done uh, for today. As rain... Rain is closing in. It's not here yet, but it... We're on the periphery of the storm. It's definitely filling the air now. That's just going to get more and more intense. I know, baby, that heavy sigh of yours. Oh, goodness gracious. All right, so what's this next one? Uh, this is from the good folks at Soho Press. This is uh, comes out in August, so you don't have to worry about this. So this is the long and the short of it. You're getting something at the end of the month and at the end of the summer, something that come out today. Uh, this is called Shudder by Pomona Emerson. Shudder. Uh, with the requisite hideous American cover. Uh, let's see here. An award-winning Dine filmmaker and former forensic photographer captures life and death on the Navajo reservation in this visceral and chilling debut. Oh, this is her debut. Fantastic. Fantastic. From Soho Press. Wonderful. All right, let's see here. Drawing on her own upbringing in the New Mexico Navajo Nation, as well as her experience working with the Albuquerque PD as a forensic photographer, the author offers a debut novel like none other. A lush depiction of life on the reservation, a southwestern police-slash-crime cartel drama that draws from real-life cases Emerson observed, and a rich, celebratory catalog of Dine culture as told through the point of view of an unforgettable girl next door who is forced to turn superhero to seek justice for the underserved. Okay, all right. Uh, am I allowed to say it's bad? It sounds like you're setting up a case that says I'm a bigot if I say this is poorly done. I hope that's not the case, but it certainly sounds it. Why do I need to know all that otherwise? Uh, but anyway, and, you know, characters in contemporary, you know, current year blue checkmark uh, fiction who become superheroes do so without any training. They do so without any believability. So is the girl next door 110 pounds soaking wet with rocks in her pockets? And if the answer to that is yes, does she start to punch out rogue DEA agents with her bare fists? I, I, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, the resulting melange of horror and crime fiction. Horror? Where is the horror element? I, horror has, that has to be supernatural, right? Doesn't, if you're going to, if you're going to invoke that genre, you're invoking the supernatural, aren't you? Uh, well, anyway, let's, uh, let's see here. It reaches a leave, a light on after reading level thrills. This may be Emerson's fiction debut, but she's no stranger to storytelling. Ooh, okay, interesting. During her 20-year career in film as a videographer, writer, and editor, she's been an Emmy nominee, a Sundance Native Lab Fellow, a Time Warner Storyteller Fellow, a Tribeca All Access Grantee, and a WGBH Producer Fellow. Good Lord. Okay, so the, the, the uh, press sheet here is entirely right. This is her debut novel, but she has a huge amount of experience telling stories. Isn't that fascinating? I wonder how it translates. Uh, let's see here. In 2020, she was appointed to the Governor's Council on Film and Media Industries for the state of New Mexico. Good Lord. Where did she find the time to write and not tape you novel is what I want to know. Although now, you know, now because it's 2022, I hear state of New Mexico, and I automatically wonder, is that one of the states in America that is in Nazi control? Is that state in Nazi hands? I honestly don't remember. At the moment, I will. The time is coming when I'll have to know that as a catechism. That'll be a, the first and only thing that I'll have to know about any state in the union. But I don't remember right now. Is New Mexico in Nazi hands? I, I have no idea. Uh, in not that it would reflect, not that it would reflect on Ramona Emerson at all. <laughs> that, that transition could have been better done. Uh, in this book, Emerson gives us Rita Totichine. Probably Totichine probably saying that wrong, a uh, forensic photographer working for the Albuquerque police force. Her excellent photography skills have cracked many cases. She's almost supernaturally good at capturing details. In fact, Rita has been hiding a secret. She sees the ghosts of crime victims who point her towards the clues that other investigators overlook. Okay, fantastic. And there is our horror element. There is at least the supernatural element. Uh, she sees murder victims. Uh, so very similar to... Uh, uh, I Will Have Vengeance, also from Soho Press, uh, uh, about 10 years ago. They, they did a series of police procedurals set in mid-20th century Naples, starring a, a police investigator who could see dead people. He couldn't hear them. They couldn't tell him anything. It sounds like, uh, like uh, Rita has a far more interactive 
involvement with the uh, with these ghosts than uh, Richardini. Was that his name, Richardini? I forget the name of the inspector. I forget the name of the author. <laughs> but anyway, the series is great. The first one is I Will Have Vengeance. Uh, and in those books, he can only see the person, and they can only repeat. They don't see him. They can only repeat the last thing they thought or said. And he has to drag clues out of that somehow. A lot of it's of no use to him whatsoever. Uh, but it sounds like Rita is going to have help from these ghosts. Uh, uh, as a lone portal back to the living for traumatized spirits, Rita is terrorized by nagging ghosts who won't let her sleep and who sabotage her personal life. Her taboo and psychologically harrowing ability was what drove her away from the Navajo reservation, where she was raised by her grandmother. It has isolated her from friends and gotten her into trouble with the law. Now it might just be what gets her killed. Oh my. Okay. Uh, all right. Great. Uh, fantastic. Well, so this is a debut novel. Shall we, shall we sample it a little? It comes out in August. We'll be getting a finished copy down the line. Sounds fascinating. Let's see how this starts. Shall we? Uh, this is chapter one. And underneath chapter one, I don't know if you make it out. Underneath chapter one are the specifics of a brand of camera. Uh, the Nikon D50. Uh, I imagine that that'll become obvious. The reason for that will become obvious. Let's see here. Souls don't scatter like the rest of the body. They latch on for as long as they can, their legs pulled up to the sky, fingertips white in desperation. Souls are grasping for us, for the ones they left behind, for the truth only they can see. They are the best witnesses to their last breaths. I stand in that bitter, cold wind with that ghost and take its picture. Tonight, nothing was left. After two hours of metal on bone and flesh on asphalt, there were only yellow plastic forensic markers linked up like soldiers on the darkened freeway, all, 70, all 75 of them marking the resting place of this soul, who was now merged with the blacktop, the blood and tissue part of its earth and chemicals. I watched the lead investigator lay another marker in the distance, 76. 76. Static crackled through the radio. We have an OMI en route, officer of medical investigator, that's what that means, a DB I-40 I westbound to Louisiana walkover, a body on the highway. Respond. Photo one, are you there? Photo one, I'm here. That's going to be our main character. That's going to be Rita, I'm sure. Uh, I knew then, that, so this is narrated in the first person, I knew then that I would be out of here for, that I'd be out here for hours. I clawed into my last pack of nicotine gum, pulling two pieces from the foil, and jerked myself into my paper suit and latex skin. Neither did anything to cut the cold. I ducked beneath the tape. We were always the first on the scene, the photographers. Next month would be a 66 months for me. Five and a half years of taking pictures of dead people. This person had been scattered, muscles and flesh torn by the push and pull of steel, by hot rubber and propulsion, speed and physics. The markers stretched out farther than I could see, a serpent of reflective yellow slithering into sky and tar. Too many people were on the scene, mostly cops surveying the carnage, telling stories in huddles, pulled together by whispers. This is pretty good. This need not be this well written and still get its point across. This is, the, this is noticeable. Uh, let a, little, a little more. Just do indulge me and then we'll stop. I walked to marker one. Surrounded by the night sky, I took the first overall photo. I perched above. The wide angle lens was just wide enough. Maybe the uh, notation of the camera is to say what she's using. Uh, a galaxy of, sim of shimmering light set off every marker, every piece of, bow of flesh bound in yellow haze. The first ten pieces were small and unrecognizable splinters of bone and chunks of tissue. By marker 21, the pieces were bigger. A waxy, oily section of skin lay before me, a photo catching every detail of newly shaven legs, of the nick she gave herself probably that morning, of a faded tattoo saying forever. I could tell it was a leg by the ghostly white bone that protruded from the flesh, a femur. 22 was a piece of ankle. 23 was a left foot with two toes missing a snake and a tree tattoo twisting out of the hole they left. When I found the toes about a foot away, they were still attached to each other by a thin rope of dry skin. 24. So she's marking these by marker. Do you want to get down, baby? I've cut stuff in your place, haven't I? There we go. There we go. Oh, <laughs> you're missing the yoga. She's stretching, but she's doing it right next to me. <laughs> let's, let's continue just a little more here. Uh, the other leg was complete, torn low in the thigh. The kneecap faced north, scuffed to the bone, but the rest of the leg twisted south. 
The bones in the legs were cleanly snapped, the exposed skin like outstretched hands. Every single bone in the right foot looked like it was broken. The pinky toe was missing. Marker 30. Good Lord. <laughs> she's just, she's assembling the body marker by marker. The hip bones were still intact, held together by the seams of the pants. About six inches of left leg remained with no bone visible. My camera focused in on the partial tire track above the brake. A breeze moved through and pushed the heavy iron scent of blood into my nose, a hint of decay catching in my throat. The iliac crest overhung the torn flesh, right above the ripped, blood-soaked pants. Glittery sequins sh shimmered when I used my primary flash. Shredded backbone pulled white, pulling white into the camera frame. I used my slave flash and hot shoe attachment and tried the image again. On the rear viewfinder, I saw a $20 bill sticking out of the pocket. I hadn't noticed it in my first gl glance. Image count, 175. Good lord. Uh... Oh, okay. Well, uh, so it's she, our photographer, our character, who hasn't named herself yet, is at the scene of the crime, and it's a, it's not a crime it, so far. It looks like just a motorcycle accident. Now, I have heard from friends of mine in Massachusetts PD, Massachusetts Highway Patrol, that that's just what it's like. It, that if it's bad, you your body can stretch on for miles, just like this. But to see it described this way, this description makes me think that this author has actually seen this kind of thing. It doesn't. It doesn't seem like a poetic reconstruction. Uh, I'm wondering, though, I, I want to skip over some of the rest of it here and see if we can get to a point where she talks to a ghost. Boy, though, this is gripping. I don't want to stop reading. Uh, uh, I wonder if this is going to, if we can, uh, no, they're talking. It is Rita. She's introduced. Uh, she talks with the cops. She takes pictures. She continues to take pictures. Uh, I followed the blood and searched for anything we might have missed. The lingering smell of death was developing. I saw it then. A small hunk of flesh hadn't been spotted by any officer or investigator. We all had walked this path before more than two or three times, but we had missed it. The skin matched the color of the slightly reddened clay on the roadside, drawn into the earth the pull of death's process. I took a few, a few pictures before they had a chance to contaminate the scene. The beams of the flashlight dropped the hollow light fixed on my boots. A piece of face, the ear and eye still intact, a lid partially open. The eye was green, turning iridescent as they watched. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, <laughs> okay. So the opening scene certainly does the trick. Uh, I... I'm not going to, I'm going to try not to read any more of this because it's an August release. It's of no immediate interest to me until then. Uh, but boy, oh boy, that was good. That was a lot better than it needed to be. Okay, fantastic. All right, so this comes out on August 2nd, which I'm assuming is uh, the first Tuesday of the month. And uh, just from that opening, you know a lot of what you need to know to determine whether or not to put this on a watch list, to put this on your, you know, TBR or whatnot. If, for instance, you like... Uh, police procedural forensic mysteries, but somehow you don't like gore. Usually they go hand in hand. Obviously, a Ramona Emerson is not going to pull punches here. She starts off with a dismembered body. It's all tactfully done. It's not luridly done at all. In fact, there's some beautiful prose there. Uh, but if that is an absolute no-no for you, then unfortunately you know that this book is a no-no for you. But boy, oh boy. <laughs> I am now, I'm now remembering what that pub sheet says about how this author, this is her debut novel, but she has a lot of experience telling stories. I'll say. <laughs> okay, all right, well, that's our mail for today. We have Shudder by Ramona Emerson, uh, which, you know, even from that opening, I mean, I worried with the pub sheet, when you're giving me that much personal information about the author and Dine culture, it, I, my, I admit my hackles are a, little, are a little up automatically for that kind of Twitter nonsense anyway. Uh, it, it, some of that, to my first blush, looked like maybe you are warning me away from criticizing this thing. But this author is a veteran of all kinds of storytelling and certainly would not want to be handled with kid gloves. And so that partially mollified my worries, but the reading of the prose is the ultimate silver bullet for any of that. I now could not care. I, I don't even care if this is intentionally designed to be critic-proof. I'm already hooked. I already know this author is talented, so I will read until she drops the ball. And if she doesn't, 
so much the better. <laughs> so much the better. So we have Shudder by Ramona Aronson, her debut, and we have uh, Rules for Engaging the Earl by Jana McGregor, uh, which is not her debut. This is a romance author that I really like. I don't care so much that I don't like the format of this. I'm hooked on both. The summary for this sounded great, and this author already has a huge amount of credit in the Bank of Steve, and this is wonderful. The opening, anyway, is totally assured. So, uh, not not the usual thing you would get from me when I'm talking about a mail hall about fiction, but nevertheless, I call them like I see them. Uh, so I'm going to wrap this up for now. That is our mail for a pre-soggy Tuesday, <laughs> and I will be back. Thank you, BookTube.